OK, that's the recording and the transcription started. Um, so within your meeting log, you can find a transcription of uh, this presentation. If you haven't yet come across it, the three dots menu in Teams will also give you uh, closed captions. So you can put um, a closed caption text of what I've been saying straight into Teams. The nice thing about that is it isn't just closed caption, it will actually translate. So if you prefer a different language, it will automatically translate while we're going on. So feel free to experiment with those. In the meantime, can I welcome new students? We have some new students this week who joined us late. So I hope you'll bear with me while I just very quickly run through uh, where we find things and how this is going to work. Um, I will do it quickly, so if there's anything that you're um, not sure about, don't understand, want me to go over, just ask. So this, as you've noticed, is Teams. This is how we'll do our online meetings. At the moment, they are all online, nothing on campus for this module at the moment. And I'll let you know if that will change at all. So you have access to Teams. And one of the nice things about Teams is you can send messages within that as well. So if you have questions to ask, it's better to do them within the team. So go to your team. Which will look something like this, but I've clearly got a lot more teams than you. You go to our team, which is here. And there are posts. So you see I've been putting up posts last week. We were talking about government governance. Um, and actually, specifically, we looked at the Highlands and Islands airports. Turns out they're looking for a new director. So you can have a look at their advert this week and see how it compares to their advert from a couple of years ago. There's also other information here about NHS Lanarkshire. Again, they're looking for people to join a board, so it gives you more information on the kind of skills that they're looking for within that board. And they are not surprisingly the sorts of things that we were talking about last week. So you can go here, you can go to posts, and you can um, post anything there. I can answer, but also the teammates can answer so we can get a discussion going. And it's better to do it in there than send me an email because um, the amount of emails I get, it may or may not get lost in the shuffle. So stick them into the posts here. So that's the first place to go. Second place is Moodle or my UWS. So all the module materials are on Moodle. Now, You'll see on Teams that there's channels down the side, stuff along the top. They're called tabs. And there's a few tabs up there that I've set up. And as I say, Moodle or my UWS is one of them. If you click on that, I'm using Firefox, so it would be unhappy, probably. Not. I know it's happy. So on Moodle are all of the materials from day one. OK, so everything is there. There's a, a menu bar here that you can open and close to see all the things we have. So it covers the topics that we'll be doing. So we're on governance last week and this week. We'll move on to risk, then IT frameworks and so on. And this is the order that we'll do things in. So there are topics here that you that we will cover in class. There are topics here with a hash against them that we will not cover in class, but you should study on your own. So these are about legislation. So I would expect that if you've joined this class, 
that. Um, sorry, I was just laughing because I've just noticed that that arrow is just pointing straight at me, saying, look at the idiot. Um, I expect when you join this module that you'll have done something on legislation already, so be, and already be familiar with a lot of the legislation around IT, around governance, that kind of thing. If you're not, these are the things I would expect you to know, and these are the things I would expect you to see in your assessment when it gets handed in. Underneath that, there is a bunch of sections with an asterisk. Those are entirely optional. So different people are coming from different places. Some of you may have done things, some of you might not have. So I've put these in here in case somebody's talking about something and you went, you know, we've never done that. It might give you a, a wee pointer to what they're talking about, but you don't need to go anywhere near them. If you don't want to, it's not obligatory and you will not be disadvantaged if you don't go near them. So you must do the ones with the hashes. You don't need to do the ones with the asterisks. Okay. So that is Moodle and all of the materials are there. So we are on governance this week and there's the presentations, the supporting material with information about them. And also some tutorial questions. Now just remind you the tutorial questions are there for you to check your knowledge. So you can go through them as many times as you want, update it as many times as you want, but the questions will give you an idea of the sort of things that you should be doing for your assessment, the sort of thing that you should see in there and that I will expect to see in there. So you can go through these questions. You can start to write them up based on the case study that we'll talk about in a minute. And that helps you start to build up your report from now. So what I'm asking you explicitly to do is not to wait until your assessment is due in, but to build it up every week as we go through the materials. It means if you have questions, that you can ask them as we go along. And it means as you get towards the end of it, you're not trying to create 40, 50 pages in a week. You've got them all there and you're just putting them all together at the end. And these questions will be the basis for that assessment. So sections are very similar each time. There'll be presentations, there'll be supporting material, and there will be quiz questions. OK, so they'll look similar for each topic. Materials, supporting materials, no quiz questions for this one. But there might be links to other uh, online materials. OK, so everything is there from day one and you can move ahead. So if you have time, read on. And in fact, that's not just a suggestion. What I'm expecting is that you will read next week's stuff. Like I said, this is all in order that we were doing it in. So read ahead to next week. It means that when we come into this meeting, I'm not just giving the presentation. You know what's coming up and you can ask questions about it. Hopefully questions that will help you in your assessment as well. So that's the first thing. We are also moving our VLE, our virtual learning environment at the moment. So as part of that, I am moving the materials elsewhere. So I'm moving them here into something called module materials. And this is uh, OneNote if you've come across it. So it's a big OneNote notebook, but it's in the same kind of format as Moodle. You may or may not find it uh, easier to use. I, I don't know. I'd be interested in the feedback. But here's the same sorts of sections down there. So there's a governance one that we just looked at on middle. There's the presentation and there's some information. OK, so in this case, rather than having the presentation just sitting beside each other, they're just in two different sections, two different pages. 
OK, so everything is on Moodle. But as I am transferring the materials, I've been adding some extra stuff. So you might find some stuff in there that you'll find useful. I've also transferred over the quiz. So it's now in uh, something called Microsoft Forms, but it's the same quiz with the same questions and you can use the answer. You can enter the answer here and you can either submit it. As I say, I won't routinely look at it, but I'm happy to answer questions. There are also recordings, so there is last week's lecture in case you missed it. It's on YouTube, so I'll put a link up here as well. I just haven't done Oh no, I have done it, I think, but it's in lectures. So in lectures, there is a tab up here and that takes you to the YouTube channel, which Firefox can't open. I knew I was going to hit that somewhere. But there's a YouTube channel for this module. And as the lectures are recorded, so there's the two that we've had so far, the induction and the governance lectures. I'll put them up and it means that you can access them. Um, I'm not what you call a YouTuber, but I believe that you can subscribe and hit a bell. So I was going to ask if you were a YouTuber. I was going to ask. <laughs> this is all new to me. So I'm learning about it. So any, any, um, any hints, more than welcome. But I believe you can subscribe and hit the bell. So do that and then uh, you'll know when I've posted the videos. The videos take a wee minute to go up. Um, it used to be that they were recorded on the university systems, something called Microsoft Stream, which is basically Microsoft's version of YouTube. So every time I did something on Teams, it would automatically be recorded and automatically posted to Stream. For reasons that I do not understand, they've stopped doing that. So the recording is now saved to my local OneDrive. Um, so I have to download it and then re-upload it. And as it's a video file, it's it takes quite a while, basically. Simple as that, it just takes a long time to transfer. I usually leave it running overnight. Um, so you won't see this, you know, like this afternoon, it will be tomorrow or Monday before it gets anywhere close to you. But if you ring the bell, it'll let you know when it's there. OK, so the, the channel itself is within Teams. As I say, I'm using Firefox. If you're using Chrome or something, that will just appear within Teams. Um, Chrome or Edge will work in the same way. So I'll put the videos with the materials in the place that they go within this OneNote notebook, and I'll also put them up on YouTube. Come on, you can do it. Told you my computer was slow this morning. OK, and you'll see that there's not as many sections down the side here. So I'm working in this. I will be ahead of where the lecture is, but how far ahead I am will depend on how much time I get to, to transfer over the material. However, when I am doing it, as I say, I'm trying to add in more things. So there's a page here in something called KPIs, something called benchmarking, which isn't in the original material. So I'm taking the chance just to add things in. So you might see things in here that you don't see in other places. OK, so we've got Teams, we've got Moodle, or my UWS, we've got YouTube, we've got the module materials that are stored in a one notebook. If you're new to UWS, or even if you're not, I've also got a student information notebook here that contains a, a whole pile of information. Some of it is module specific. You know about assessment regulations or pass marks or whatever it happens to be. Some of it is helpful resources. And again, I, I, I've been adding to these as I go along. I, I've mentioned here that this gets updated all the time. So it's things like uh, the referencing guide, because of course you'll have to reference for your assessment. Um, hints on how to do that. So 
as well as a referencing guide, there's a tool called Mendeley site. So I've put in some help on how to use that. So basically there's a whole bunch of stuff in here which you can use uh, and you should certainly have a look through it just to um, get an idea of what's in there. And some of the stuff is very useful. For example, if um, you're not used to creating big reports, well, there's something called Designer in Microsoft Word, which will um, help you design your document. So it tries to help you come up with a, a good looking, oops, a good looking document. Okay. Lots of good tools in there. Feel free to explore and use them. Okay, I think they're helpful. I also have created links to things that you'll find useful. Again, I had in Firefox security because this is stored in something called Wakelet. And it's just a place where I can store links. Uh, so this was the original place where I had links to useful things. Videos, documents, that kind of stuff. As I've been updating the module materials, a lot of these have gone into the OneNote notebook, so um, you might see them in multiple places. Similarly, there are UWS links, so links for the university as well. And again, these get updated um, as I'm going along. So Teams, Moodle, or my UWS, um, OneNote documents, and the final thing I want to talk about is the assessment. So we might as well look at that within module materials in Teams. So remember, if you were here last week and if you weren't, the assessment for this is one report. The report is based on a case study. So I need you to read the case study. Okay, there's quite a big case study here talking about uh, an organisation. And what they have asked you to do is to create a report as the newly appointed group compliance manager to create a governance risk and compliance strategy for this organisation. So you need to look at the organisation figure out where they have issues, the sorts of things that they need to address, and then come up with a report. Now, I've made some bullet points here of things that you absolutely positively must have, no question. Um, but that's not a complete list. Feel free to add in more things. I have also put in a marking scheme to give you an idea of where the marks will be given. And you can see that they correspond roughly to the sections that I showed you earlier that we'll be covering. There are also things for proper academic referencing and for a professional report. So 20% of it is just on that. So there are two parts to the report. The first is the report that goes to the board the board of this fictitious organisation. But the idea is when the board get this document, they can look at it and go, well, I don't understand about what you mean by a risk register. So you will have an appendix which you talk about what risk registers are, why you need them, why it's important for the organisations to have them. So the board, if they don't understand what's in your report, can go to your appendices and look up what you've um, talked about in there to get an idea of why you recommended those. Okay, 
And that, I think, is it for anybody new. I know that we've covered some of this a couple of weeks ago now, for some of you. Um, but I don't think it does any harm just to remind you, you know, that we're a couple of lectures in, and it's certainly required for anybody that's joining us. So anybody get any questions or comments about any of that? Um, Tony. Yeah. Just a minute. So we're going to have two report. One goes to you and one to the board. Is that, is that the right? It is one report, but with an appendix. OK, so it's one one document. OK, split well, up into the report to the board, plus as many appendices as you feel are necessary. So, for example, you might think that, well, what I'll do is I'll create an appendix for governance and an appendix for risk management. So that if people want to go and look at appendix two to understand risk management, they can. Those are then bound together into one document. OK, so it's one complete document consisting of multiple sections. All right, thank you. Fair enough. OK, that make more sense? Yeah, yeah, true. Don't forget, it is a proper academic report and it must be fully referenced in the UWS style. If you're not sure what that is, there's information in the student information document. Any other questions just now? Okay. So if you can create appendices and if the appendices are based on the sections, then you can be writing those appendices as we go along. And then you have a document that you bind together and is ready for handing. Because of course, one of the things that we also have is our schedule, our syllabus. So again, there's another tab here called files. And then class materials as a spreadsheet that says what we'll be doing and when. So this is the 30th of September. So according to our spreadsheet, I have a reminder for Tony. Okay, Google, stop. <laughs> Sorry about that. According to our spreadsheet, on the 30th of September, we are doing the second part of governance. Okay, so you know what's coming up, which means that you can get ahead what I was speaking about earlier. You can read the stuff, try and understand it, and then I'm available to ask questions. And the other thing we decided for anyone new is that we are going to have our um, assessment a wee bit earlier. So it's due in on the 25th of November. The idea is to get this one out of the way before all your other ones are due. So it means you're not trying to do everything at once. OK. So it tells you when everything is and when the assessment's due. And that's only two months away less than two months away, so you definitely want to be starting to do it. OK, any other questions just now? OK, in that case, the last thing I want to say for anybody that's new is these meetings are obligatory, so you must turn up. OK, so we are on week two of governance. Computer is so slow. So 
So last week we spoke about governance, what it is, uh, the difference between governance and management, that kind of thing. And of course, you can watch that again if you missed it or if you want to relive the joys of that lecture. So what I want to do uh, first of all is to give you an idea of how that might work in practice. So I mentioned last week that uh, one of the issues that we sometimes have with a subject like this is that commercial organisations tend to see things like governance and particularly risk as a commercial secret. Not surprisingly, the um, can you imagine uh, if you had a risk document for your organisation that was floating outside? all of your competitors would immediately be able to look at your document and go, oh, that's nice mm -hmm. to know. This is where they're worried about things happening. So things like governance and risk documents can be tricky to find. So what I tend to do is use local government documents because they are publicly funded. They tend to be available for everyone to look at and use. So it means that I can grab them from their websites and I can make them available to you. And that's what I've done in here. So because uh, there's a legal obligation for that, we get to see them. So we talked last week about the difference between governance and management. Oh, sorry, the last thing. I was about to say I promise the last thing for the new people, but probably won't be. If you're wondering why I'm looking around, I've got multiple screens here. You guys are up there. The stuff that I'm working on is up there. The stuff that I'm showing you is up there. And I'm controlling it all down here, which is also where my camera is, which is why I tend not to be looking at you. Because I'm looking at you on the screen or I'm looking at the stuff I'm showing you over there. So my apologies if you think I'm watching tennis. I'm not really. I'm just uh, trying to work with the stuff that I have. So um, these are governance documents from local from a local government sample uh, council. And they give us an idea of how organisations might choose to set up their governance structures because there's no there's no rule as such. You don't say this is how you do it. There's, there's guidelines, there's best practice. There are you, know, you can look at how other organisations do it, but there's nothing that says you must do this. So, we talked last week about governance and the difference in management and the fact that governance is about setting the aims and aspirations of an organisation. So that's what this first document is. It's about, oops, it's about the aims and aspirations for this organisation, which for a local council is known as the council plan. Now it's located in this agenda item here. And the reason it's an agenda item is because it had to go to the governing body of this organisation. In this particular case, it's called a council. And you'll see on the agenda, at item 10, this thing here, the council plan. The aims and aspirations of this council for the next five years. This is an older document, clearly. So this had to go to the governing body to get approval. So it will have been created by the management in consultation with the governing body to say, okay, well, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? That will then be worked up into a document, which will then be formally approved at this meeting. 
This is called a council meeting. It could be a board meeting. It could be whatever your organization uses. So that plan is shown at item 10 there. So if I jump down to item 10, you'll see that it says that the council note the responses and to agree the plan. OK, so it has to come here to get agreed. Management have written it, but governance, in this case the council, has to agree it. If they don't agree, it doesn't go ahead. If someone makes an amendment, and if they get support of the board, it can be changed. So they can decide that they want to do something different. So there's a whole bunch of stuff about the background and how they worked out how they were going to do this, who they consulted with, so those stakeholders involved. And it then gives the plan itself as an appendix. So there's a report to the board, and as an appendix for that, if they have questions about all this stuff, they can actually go and see the documents themselves. Appendix one. OK, so this harks back to the way I'm wanting you to write your report. It's the same kind of idea. There's an appendix that answers these details. Well, what is it that you want us to do? Oh, well, I want us to. Yeah. I want the organisation to have a mission. So we had a mission statement. Again, we spoke about that last week. And here we have a vision. So making the area fair for everyone. A mission to improve the well-being and prosperity and equity in North Ayrshire. So again, it's trying to encompass it, a very uh, pithy sentence. And things that the organisation will do to make that happy, that they believe in fairness, so they'll tackle inequality, that they want to drive change, that they have priorities for outcomes and will focus resources on that. They've tried to make it accessible. It's a public body after all, so there's nice infographics to start talking about why this has happened. You know, 95% of people, of school leavers, are fairly successful. They go into more education, training or employment. OK, so there's information about it. And then it talks about priorities. But the priorities aren't just on the organisation as a whole. They're on, they're focused on the different parts. So it might be about communities or the place or what's going to happen in the future, and so on. OK. Again, feel free to jump in if anyone has any questions at any point. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. OK, so there is the agenda papers where the governance body had to agree to that. Once they have, that's then sent out as a specific document to everybody that's interested. So there's the same document that you saw in the papers. They're well, not an appendix anymore. No appendix up there. This is the document. This is what they'll be working to. Because they have a vision, because there's things that they want to do, they have to have some sort of measurement for that. 
So they have something called a performance management framework. Thank you. Sorry, tea time. Cheers. There's something called a performance management framework. And it takes measures, key performance indicators, and it says where they're starting and where they're trying to get to. So the very first one there, percentage of population who are involved in local decision making is currently at 51% and they're targeting 60%. So they want to make it better because they've decided that more people being involved in local decision making is a good thing. So they want more people involved. That brings up the question, if they want more people involved, why is the target 60% instead of 100%? And that is a question for you to see whether you've fallen asleep or still paying attention. Why not just make the target 100%? Cuz it's unlikely to be achieved. Correct. There's no point in setting targets that simply are unrealistic. All that does is if someone had set a target there of 100%, everybody that would dread it would say but we've no chance. So if no chance of hitting the target, why do we even bother trying to make it better? So instead, set reasonable targets. Yes, you want to get better. Yes, you want to improve, but be realistic in those aspirations. But what it does is that this performance management framework allows Measurement, it says whether or not you're doing better. So you've decided what your measures are to do better. You say what they are just now and you say what you want to be. So it allows you to measure your own performance. It also allows the governing body to measure the performance of the management. Why haven't you hit 60%? Or why have you hit 70%? So there'll be continual reports coming back saying, why things have or haven't happened. If you have a framework, then you probably want a plan as to how you're going to reach the targets that you've set. So to go along with it, there's a transformation plan looks at different projects, it puts them in the different places that they're working, and it says what will happen in each of those places. So again, specific targets. And because we want buy-in, this shouldn't be just a, a governance and management thing, this should be a whole organisation thing. There's even a poster that you can distribute to workplaces, put up on the wall, and say, OK, this is what we want to do. When you come into work today, remember this is what we are trying to do and work towards this, please. So we're trying to get buy-in from the whole organisation. OK, so that's the governance part. But as we said, governance and management are different. So in this case, what we have is something called, oh, sorry. This is a governance part. So we have governance, but as you can imagine, this is a big organization. You saw that there was a whole pile of different areas for um, improvement, a whole pile of areas that you want to look at. So it's probably not um, it's probably not feasible to have the same set of people doing the same things, doing all those things. Instead, you probably want to split the workload. In this particular case, it's called a scheme of administration. 
So it says things like, okay, one of the things that this organisation has to do is approve licences for pubs or restaurants or whatever. So let's set up a committee whose job it is to only look at licences. And that can be important because licensing, there is a whole set of legislative structures around licensing. So the people that are doing that will get specialised training. They'll get training in the law and how it applies to what they are doing. So there's a scheme of administration, but that then has to delegate down to the management of the organisation. So then, so we have a scheme of administration, how it's going to be set up, and then a scheme of delegation to say who is responsible for which part. Officers in this case are the, the council name for management, and it says how things are going to get delegated and who they're going to get delegated to. And we were just talking about licensing, and I happen to know that on page 14, it says quite specifically, that the head of service for democratic services is responsible for licensing services. So we have governance and management working together. And who is responsible is made very clear both in the scheme of administration for governance and the scheme of delegation for management. So, for example, the, the licensing board are there to look after licensing, but they probably won't get involved in the day to day of appointing a clerk and a deputy clerk who, who, who provides services to the licensing committee. They won't get involved in that day to day appointing of staff. And there's a whole pile of things that the. The management are involved in. OK. Partly because for a lot of these things, there is legislation involved and it's important. That that legislation is followed. So the. The. Person who takes on that job as head of licensing will typically be a lawyer. Someone who understands the legislation and can advise. The governance licensing committee appropriately. So they'll take advice on what is feasible within the legislation. Everyone OK with that so far? Yes. OK. So once you have that uh, scheme of administration and a scheme of delegation, you start to think about how people work in that. So there'll be a code of conduct. And I'll say things like, well, if you're on the licensing committee and your brother in law applies for a license for a pub, you should probably not take part in that decision. That would be poor conduct on your part because you have an interest in that. It's a family member. So there is a. A code of conduct. And that is then um, taken and adopted by the organisation in this case for something called an IJB. So the IJB has a register of interests. So anyone who's on the governance of this. Board. Has to register. Interests, gifts, hospitality. That kind of stuff. So here is a random. So each person that's on this board will fill out one of these forms. It'll say who they are. It will see what interest they have. Any contracts. 
that they're involved in with the organisation? Any financial interests that they have? So if you're appointed to one of these boards, your finances become public knowledge. Some of you will remember the um, the issues that America had when Trump refused to re release his financial interests. Here in the UK, it, it's a matter of law. You have to. So we can see here that somebody has shares in these different organisations. And they also say which other uh, boards or committees or groups or organisations that they belong to. And everyone who's a member of that board will fill out one of these forms. And this one does a lot less. This person doesn't have anything that they need to declare. Okay. So to ensure clarity, there has to be a register of interests for everybody that sits on one of these governance boards. And as part of that, there will also be a, a set of rules for how money is spent. In this particular case, it's called standing orders relating to contracts. And it basically says if you're going to, if this organization is going to spend some money, these are the rules that we must follow. And you can see nearly 50 pages of it. Things that you have to do, how you have to say that the money is going to be spent, how you'll get tenders and how you'll evaluate them, all of that kind of stuff is all written down so that everyone understands how it works and how it's supposed to work. So all that governance stuff that we talked about in theory last week, this is how it's put into practice, at least for this particular organisation. There are other organisations, so I did manage to find uh, governance structures for Santander. The reason Santander did this, of course, was because they had a big scandal in terms of their governance. So in order to try and um, rebuild trust in the public, they decided to put their corporate governance on show. So you can have a look at that as well. Anybody get any questions? Oh, those records are, are they public or? Are what public, sorry? Those records are, are in yes, public? Yes, those records are public, yep. Thanks. So you're talking about things like the register of interests and the standing orders. All of this stuff is public. That's how I can get access to it. I just went onto the website and downloaded it. Thank you. Any other questions? No. OK, well, that's been just over an hour. So may I suggest that we take a quick comfort break? And I'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Yes, thank you. Thank you.
Where we go? Okay, I am a stone away. A no, no, lay. What stone set in a bay? A when he because you are I they use your earpiece for Oh, I guess some. No, I guess some handkerchief for my things inside or something. Okay, so we now have to go pick some car. So, eh, because it call no smart. Open the recover. Okay, and we are back. Okay. Okay. So, anyone thought of any questions while they've been away? Hey, Jefferson, you know your mic's on. Thank you. Anybody, any questions while they're away? No, all happy. Okie doke, in that case, let's move on. Um, what we have so far is governance in principle, governance and practice. And we also have talked about governance in terms of improvement. So you saw the, the framework and the and the key performance indicators, the performance framework and so on. And that's a, a key part of governance is continual improvement. It's probably a key part of most things. Um, don't you want to get better? So, <coughs> excuse me. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is how we might think about getting better, whatever better means. And that might seem like a flippant remark, but of course, um, better can be different for different organisations. If a 
if a business has more money in the bank at the end of the year than the start, that's a win. If a charity has more money at the end of the year than at the start, it probably isn't. And even for the business, more money might not mean that you're doing better. If you have more money, shouldn't you be expanding? Shouldn't you be opening more shops? Shouldn't you be, you know, whatever? So part of governance is improvement. Part of that is putting in the plan. And we just saw an example plan, which you will then do. So you, you carry out the plan and you check against your expectations. So you saw a starting point, you saw an expected end point. We're going to check that as we go along because you don't you don't set a five year plan and go, yeah, we'll see you in five years. You check it every. Well. You decide what's appropriate. There's no point giving monthly feedbacks on. The number of. The number of children that got five hires because that only happens once a year. So get feedback on that once a year. On the other hand, you probably want financial information regularly to make sure that you're staying within your budget. So there's a check going on all the time. You check what's happening and you can take action on that. So if your finances are struggling, you might want to change your budget for the year to decide to do something different. So there's this continual plan, do, check, act. And you'll see it never stops. It's iterative. You keep going and keep going and keep going. Because hopefully you always want to make your organization better. Now I'm doing PDCA. Um, You'll see in other places they do similar things, but they're called different names. So COBIT uses plan, build, run, monitor. But it's the same idea. You plan it, you do it or build. You then run it. And monitor and that's the check. And then you plan to do something different. So it, it's the same kind of idea. But at the basis of it, you will continue to receive reports. So earlier on, we looked at the agenda that had the council plan in it. Why, when I do things, does it always open up on the wrong screen? So we had the council plan earlier, this item, but the very next item is about the accounts. So it's looking at the finances and looking to see how the money is being spent and whether it's working well and all that kind of stuff. So there's continual reports, annual accounts, investment reports, So there's a continual push to being better. And that's what I want to talk about a wee bit more today. Is this idea of getting better, this PDCA thing. So hopefully. You'll all have read this presentation before because you've all had it and you all knew it was coming up. So hopefully you've all read it and you'll all be ready with loads and loads of questions and I'm monitoring the comments in case you have questions. But, you know, feel free to just unmute and ask at any point. OK, so we are. Carrying out. Uh, an iterative process to get Better. 
Come on, slow computer, you can do it. Come on, you're only moving on a slide. How hard can it be? Oh, and I see my screen's frozen too. Come on, you can do it. Yay. So, there's a cycle that goes on. We continually, iteratively try to get better. And like most things, sometimes it can be helpful to actually codify these things. In this particular case, it's PDCA. Plan, do, check, act. Because you can't do anything if you don't know what you're trying to do. If, um, if I tell you to leave your house and go to Aberdeen, do you leave your house and start walking and hope for the best? That at some point, if you're lucky, you'll see a sign that says Aberdeen and you'll get there? Or do you pause? figure out where Aberdeen is and make a plan on the best way to get there. Well, if you do it for just something as simple as that, why wouldn't you do it for something far more complex like running an organisation? So you need to plan what you're doing. Understand what it is you want to do. So we're back to those aims again. Figure out where you want to be and then work your way through to do that. So that's the do part. You carry out the plan. But it doesn't always go to plan. If I plan to drive to Aberdeen and the M9 has a has roadworks, I might have to divert. I might have to take another route. So my plan didn't work. So I need to rethink and redo my plan. So when you do the plan, you continually check to see if you've reached your objective. And if you haven't, you might have to uh, redo the plan. And sometimes, instead of having one humongous plan, rather than saying, here's a 10 year plan that we will never deviate from, it can help to split things up into smaller chunks. That's a general thing. It's exactly what I'm talking about with this assessment. Rather than saying, here's a 50 page report for the board. Well, split it into smaller chunks and say, here's a five page appendix on governance and here's a five page appendix on risk. So you split it into smaller steps that are easier to understand and to, to carry out. It also means that you can change if something goes wrong. So my road to Aberdeen might say something like, OK, leave my house, go to Glasgow, then go to Stirling, then go to Perth, and then go to Aberdeen. I might change that. And if there's two of us travelling, we might go, well, actually, is going to Perth and then Aberdeen the fastest? Shouldn't we go to Dundee and then to Aberdeen? And you might say, well, let's test it out. I'll take the Perth Road, you take the Dundee Road, we'll meet up in Aberdeen and see how we got on. That's called A-B testing. You do, you attempt to reach the same destination, but you take a different route. You quite often see it in things like um, programs or websites. If you're trying to create a better website, you're never quite sure if what you've created is better. So you might push out a new version, but not to everybody. So you might say, well, 10% of the people who come to this website will see this new version. And then you monitor it. And we're back to that monitor again. Check it, see if it actually is better. So we'll do things, we'll plan something, we'll do it, and we might decide it will take more than one route to, to get there. And then once we do it, we'll check what was bet. Who's getting there faster? Are we reaching the goals that we've set ourselves? Are we where we expected to be? 
I expected it to take me two and a half hours to reach Stirling. Why did it take me four hours? I expected us to have 50% of our budget left. Why have we only got 40%? Or I expected to have 50%. How come I've still got 60%? Are we not doing everything we said we'd do? So you evaluate what's happening. So again, you need to do these reports coming in to evaluate what's happening, figure out where you are compared to where you expected to be, and see whether you are what you want, are where you wanted to be. And a key part of that is also checking testing. You can't just say bigger is better or smaller is better. You have to understand the context. So you can't say, well, we've got more of our budget left, therefore we have more money, therefore yay us. Because it could be that the reason you've got more money left is that you haven't done the things that you said you would do. So actually, even though that aspect sounds good, how can not having more money not be good? It has meant that you didn't do what you said you would do. So you need to figure out how you test and understand how that fits in with what you wanted to do. And once you've done all that, then you can take action. You can figure out if you need to change direction, take a different route, work to a different standard, maybe even change your aim altogether. So you change. So the act part is sometimes known as adjust. You change what you're doing. And this might take lots of iterations. Anybody who's ever done any sort of project will know that. You do something, it doesn't quite work, you fix it, doesn't quite work, you fix it, doesn't quite work, fix it, doesn't quite work, fix it. Oh, it's worked. Anybody who's ever done any programming will know that. Anybody who's ever wired up a, a network and found a dead node will know how that feels that you find an error and you fix it. So it's an iterative process where you do the plan, keep going until eventually you solve the problem. So it's continuous. You have to keep going. And of course, when you're doing that, your baseline changes. So if you're running a shop and you say, I want to increase sales by 10% by the end of the year, that's a laudable aim. And it's even more laudable if that's what happens. But what do you do in year two? Do you say, no, I've done my 10%, I'm happy, I'm sitting back and that's my aim for next year. Or do you say, no, let's do another 10% for next year. So you have to reevaluate your plan and figure out where you're going and what you want to do. In other words, your base, where you're starting from, continually changes, so your aims will also change. So as well as an iterative plan, do, check, act, you have an iterative process of movement where your baseline hopefully gets higher. So as you go through your project, your quality improves, but you want to continue to improve that quality. It's never a, yeah, we are happy with this, or at least it shouldn't be a, yes, we're happy with this. It should be a continual improvement. Is everyone happy with that explanation? Does anyone have any questions or comments about that part? All happy? Yes, all good so far. OK. So if we're doing this process, we're making the plans, we're carrying them out, we're checking how they work, we're adjusting them as required. One of the questions we're going to have to ask ourselves is, OK, so we've not done what we expected to do. Why is that? What's happened to make that part of the project fail. 
So there's a technique that organisations can use. There's lots of techniques and you'll find them as your, your career progresses. So I'm just going to cover this one as a, as a fairly standard one that lots of organisations will use and that you can incorporate into your career. It's called the five whys. The idea is that rather than say, why didn't this work? You try and understand a deeper cause. It's unusual that the first thing that goes wrong is the reason it's gone wrong. So on my travels to Aberdeen, I broke down between Perth and Dundee. Why was that? Oh, because I don't have any petrol. All right, put in petrol, we're done. No, not really. Why didn't we have petrol? Oh, because it wasn't filled up. Why? Well, nobody checked to see how much petrol we had in the car. So you could stop at the we don't have petrol, we need more. Or you can continue on to try and understand why you don't have petrol and what needs to be done to change that to ensure that in future that doesn't happen again. That's called a root cause. So you try and drill down to understand the root cause. And the root cause might be if I am leaving and I know that I'm traveling 400 miles, maybe I should check that my car has enough fuel to make 400 miles. The reason it's called a five whys is anecdotally, um, that's the number of whys you need to get to a root cause. It's not a it's not a rule. It's just don't stop at one, keep going until you get to it. And five is usually a, a reasonable place where you'll get that. So, so here's another car example. You know, you go out and your car doesn't stop. Why? The battery's dead. And you could stop there and you could say, all right, battery's dead. Take it out, go charge it up, put it back in. You do that, car starts, away you go, fantastic. Until you go out the next day and the same thing happens. So you don't stop at the, the battery's dead. You ask yourself, why is the battery's battery dead? And in a car, there's something called an alternator, which takes the mechanical motion of the engine and converts it into electrical energy that can feed back into the battery. So the alternator is not functioning, so the battery is not getting recharged as you're driving it. Why not? Well, as it happens, there's a connection between the engine and the alternator called an alternator belt, and that's broken. So the mechanical energy in the engine isn't reaching the alternator to create the electrical energy needed for the battery. Great, so we just fix the belt. Well, no, hang on. Why did the belt break? It could just be unlucky. But in this particular case, if we look at it, we see actually the belt was really frayed. Because it's a belt, it's a, it's a disposable part in an engine, and it's something that's supposed to be replaced regularly. After every X thousand miles or after every Y years, and we find out that it wasn't replaced. Why not? Because the vehicle wasn't maintained according to its recommended schedule. So you could stop there and say, well, the problem, the reason we have a flat battery is the vehicle's not been maintained. You could go to the next line and say, well, who's supposed to maintain it? But that's not what the five whys is about. It shouldn't be about blaming someone it should be about finding the problem and then coming up with a solution. So in this particular case, the reason that the battery is dead and the vehicle doesn't start is that this organisation doesn't have a process to regularly maintain the vehicles. So we can go back to our PDCA. We can plan what is an appropriate maintenance schedule for this vehicle? Because of course they'll be different depending on the kind of vehicle there are. Uh, 
a, a, a vehicle that does lots of small journeys has different stresses on it to a vehicle that does longer journeys. A vehicle that starts more often has different stresses to one that you turn on and then don't turn off until you reach your destination. So you have to figure out what the maintenance schedule is going to be. Then you have to do it, so you implement it. And then you do a check. Did this work? Are we still breaking down? And it could be that you still do get some uh, breakdowns. So you might be responsible for uh, maintaining a fleet of delivery vehicles. Those vehicles tend to do lots of short journeys where they start up, drive, stop, start up, drive, stop, start up, drive, stop. That puts more stress on the alternator belt, which might mean that the manufacturer's recommended schedule might need to be changed for your particular implementation. So you adjust it. Instead of replacing the alternator belt every year, you replace it every six months or whatever the number should be. And you go through the process again. That's now your new maintenance schedule. So you implement it and then you check it and then you keep going. There are techniques for doing this. Um, one of the ones you might want to do is just to get everyone who knows about the issue together. Have somebody whose job it is to facilitate it. Not usually someone that's in management because you want people to actually feel free to talk and not feel as if they can't say anything because they are blamed. Don't use computers, get people in a room, which I know is difficult at the moment. Normally, you would get people in a room, use a whiteboard or something, and start talking about the pro problem. What is the issue? Make sure people understand what that issue is and what they need to do. Try and separate out the cause from the symptom. The symptom was the vehicle wouldn't start. The cause eventually is poor maintenance schedule. The causes along the way are alternator not working and alternator belt broken and so on. So try and make sure you understand what happens and why. So you can quite often use the magic words and therefore. The car didn't start, why? The battery was dead. Why? All the way down to and we did not perform the maintenance schedule. At which point you say and therefore. So you start moving your way back up and therefore we need to look at the maintenance schedule. And if we look at the maintenance schedule and therefore the belt will be replaced at reasonable intervals and therefore the belt won't break and therefore the alternator will work and therefore the battery will stay charged and therefore the vehicle will start when we expect it to. So we can start working our way back up. It can be very difficult because people want to go from the start to the end in one bound. Which is why you need somebody there to help guide the discussion and make sure there's no steps missed to understand the cause and effect at each link in the chain. And it has to be based on understanding of what's going on. It can't just be a guess. You have to be able to say this is the reason because. And always, always, always remember that it's not about blaming. It's not saying, oh, you should have done this or. It's about understanding what the process should be so you can make a plan to fix that process and put that into place. So it's never about it's Fred's fault. It's about trying to understand it so that you can make things better. When you get to the point where an organisation is blaming people for things that aren't going on or um, 
putting pressure on them to not uh, to not say where they think the issues are or where they feel as if they can't speak out in case they're blamed for something, then you've got a dysfunctional organisation. It's about trusting and understanding that everybody wants the best for the organisation. So you keep going through the whys, figure out what's happened, and then you can start to work out your plan to fix it. But you can plan, you can implement it, you can do it, you can check it and you can act. So all these things start to work together. Quite often, of course, what you want to do for a lot of these things isn't to look at the answer from the organization's point of view, it's to look at it from the customer's point of view, or the stakeholder's point of view, to make sure that what you're implementing is the best for them, not just you. Any questions about that? None at the moment. No, nope. all happy. Okay, so there would normally at this point be um, a task, a tutorial. Oh, come on, computer. You can do this. Um, the task for this one isn't contained in this presentation. It was contained in last week's presentation. So if you remember, at the end uh, the task was to take the stuff you've learned about governance, about PDCA, to go to your assessment, to understand the case study, and to then draw out both your recommendations and the reasons for those recommendations for the case study. And what we'll do every week is I will be here to support, help, answer questions, do whatever. OK, what I'm going to do just now is stop the recording. Uh, in case anyone has any questions that they didn't want recorded. And just remember that this recording will be available once it's been processed.